Alrighty. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joshua Ansaldua. Um, I want to welcome you to our, our uh, seminar this evening. Um, I am the Associate Director of the Joint Admission Medical Program um, in Texas. I am happy to, um, to be here tonight and share this virtual space with, their, with everyone, students, parents, um, school, mem school, school community members, as well as others from all over the state and all over the nation. Um, tonight's seminar um, is hosted by the Joint Admissions Medical Program, um, the Texas Medical and Dental, and Dental Schools Application Service, and the Texas Health Education Service. We hope this seminar will um, really help break the ice into um, our shared understanding of what it means to not only be a first generation college student, but to be a first generation medical um, school student. Um, so as we, you know, to help us get there, we do have an exciting agenda. Um, we'll begin uh, our seminar by debunking some common narratives of the medical school journey. Um, we'll listen to some words and stories of wisdom from our guest speaker, Dr. Felix Morales. We'll hear a little bit of, uh, about a program in Texas, um, JAMP, um, that assists students from the Lone Star State pursuing medical school education. Um, we'll also have an opportunity um, to hear uh, testimonials and experiences from a first-generation medical school student panel um, and a parent who are willing to kind of share their experiences with us of what it means to be first-gen uh, first medical student um, and what that looks like. And finally, we'll end with a question and answer session uh, with our attendees and um, with some closing remarks as well. Um, I know all this, is, uh, all this sounds very exciting, um, so we're happy to be here with y'all. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Um, Matthew Meeks to share a welcome with our guests and panelists tonight. Dr. Meeks is the Executive Director of the Texas Health Education Service and the Joint Admission Medical Program. Um, Dr. Meeks, the virtual stage is all yours. All right, thank you, Joshua. Good afternoon or evening, everyone. Uh, we have all come together today along with our guest speaker, Dr. Felix Morales, and our guest panelists to motivate and inspire you uh, as you begin your journey to medical school. And in our organization, uh, the Texas Health Education Service and JAMP uh, and TMDSCS has developed a host of resources to educate and equip you to be successful throughout the process. And one such resource uh, that you may hear throughout the presentation uh, is the Inside Health Education Newsroom. And this is the resource you're going to want to bookmark. Uh, it's the only resource like it in the country. And here uh, we publish the latest news and information about admissions, uh, our member institutions, and educational resources so you can always be in the know. Uh, so make sure to check back often for updates. And, and before I begin, uh, I want to just ask our, our first question uh, for the audience, and you can use the comment uh, the comment box here to respond. I uh, just want to hear where, where everybody fr uh, everybody's from. You can just uh, post it in the comments box there, and and uh, city and state. Okay. Got folks. Uh, tuning in from across the country. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, and as you can continue to use the comment uh, dialog box there to interact with us throughout the presentation. Uh, and, and I just want to say that, that we know that so many of you have uh, seen and experienced the state of healthcare uh, in our country and here in Texas and in your communities. Many of you are here today because you want to answer the call of service to be equipped by uh, the world-class medical education that we have here in Texas uh, so that you can make a difference in your communities and throughout the world. Uh, and that's what we're here to do today, to help you see the vision for your own path uh, and to discover the opportunities available to help you along your journey to becoming a physician. And we know uh, that it can be a scary process, but you are not alone. Nearly 20% of our medical students in Texas are first-generation students. Uh, we have heard incredible stories about 
uh, their journeys to medical school. And it's, it's just a, it's incredibly in inspiring. And now we want to inspire you today. Uh, so, you know, in our work, we we actually we, we hear a lot of uh, what we call myths about medical education in Texas, myths about admissions and the cost uh, and medical the medical educational experience. And so before we begin uh, and introduce our speaker for today, I've asked uh, Dr. Robles, uh, the director of the Joint Admission Medical Program, uh, to review with us just a few of the myths we encounter frequently. frequently. Dr. Robles. Thank you, Dr. Meeks. I really appreciate it. Uh, well, as Dr. Meek said, you know, uh, part of our job, uh, part of what we do is we help educate people. Uh, and with that, uh, there's some common myths that we tend to hear uh, quite a bit. So one of the big ones uh, that we always hear is, hey, you know, it takes a long time to earn money as a physician. Uh, but did you know, actually, that first year physicians in residency earn about $60,000 per year? Uh, so that's after medical school. Uh, and then as they continue on, primary care physicians earn an average of $260,000 a year, and specialists can earn even an average of $368,000 a year. Uh, and you can see our source there. Uh, so yeah, no, um, you can earn a lot of money a lot quicker uh, than you might think, uh, actually, uh, as you pursue a, um, a career towards becoming a physician. But as you're doing that, you might be saying, well, I'm taking dual credit work. Um, you know, that doesn't really matter uh, for, you know, medical school. Well, that's not actually accurate either, um, believe it or not. Know that all of your college credit um, is considered towards your GPA when you're doing your medical school application. So this includes dual credit, AP credit, and any coursework actually taken a regional credit at an undergraduate institution. All of this uh, certainly does play into effect uh, when considering your overall GPA. And finally, uh, really a big one that we often hear is going to medical school uh, is expensive and it's stupid high. Well, did you know actually that six of the 10 lowest cost public medical schools in the country are in Texas? Uh, and that's from the US News. So you might actually find that it's a little bit more affordable than you actually think. So when you combine that plus the earning potentials plus everything else that you have, you know, you might find that this pathway is definitely one that you can actually pursue as well. Uh, Dr. Meeks, will you take us through the rest of our presentation? Thank you, Dr. Robles. Uh, so many myths, and that's why we do what we do here at the Texas Health Education Service uh, and JAMP and TMD SES, educate uh, and prepare students along this path towards becoming physicians. Uh, all right, now I'm gonna turn it over back, uh, turn it back over to uh, Mr. Enzel Dua to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you. Thank you both for, for sharing your words with us. Um, now, as we transition into uh, our uh, guest speaker uh, presentation, um, I would like to say that it is my great pleasure to introduce everyone um, this evening to Dr. Felix, Mor Felix Morales. Dr. Morales is a Fort Stockton, Texas native and holds his undergraduate and medical degrees from Texas Tech University. Dr. Morales currently serves as the Associate Dean of Admissions and Diversity at the Texas um, Tech University Health Sciences Center School of Medicine and as the chair elect for the Joint Admission Medical Program uh, Council. Dr. Morales is married with two boys, is bilingual and intimately familiar with West Texas and the Panhandle region. Welcome, Dr. Morales. The floor is yours. Thank you, Josh. That was uh, thank you for that or introduction. I am humbled by that for sure. So um, I'll reintroduce myself once again. Um, my name is Dr. Felix Morales. I'm the Associate Dean of Admissions for uh, the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center School of Medicine. I also serve as a, um, an Associate Professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. So I'm board certified in family medicine as well. And um, uh, quite honestly, I still practice full spectrum family medicine, so I don't know if I have enough time to answer questions at the end of the presentation or whenever. If there ever is a question about my career track and choice, you can always uh, message me as well. But quite honestly, too, I was on call last night, so if I fall asleep while giving my presentation, I apologize. <laughs> I had to help deliver a baby last night. Uh, so I'm going to move forward here. Um, and kind of talked a little bit about four different things here today. Um, one, obviously talk about my own personal journey. 
uh, talk about why diversity is important in the context of this first gen seminar. Uh, why is mentoring first gen students important as well? And then, you know, I'd be remiss if I wouldn't have this platform to provide some words of wisdom, especially for those younger students who are in the high school, early college years. Um, and even for the medical students, and I see a few faces there that I recognize. And so I'm going to kind of move forward from there. So as my journey begins, before this little guy, uh, many years ago, over 47 years ago, became this big guy here, uh, there are many steps. But um, I, I really want to start my my discussion and my own personal journey with my my two parents. Uh, you know, with this is my foundation. This is uh, what really kind of helped lead me forward through life. And uh, this is my parents on their wedding day back on May twenty fifth, nineteen. Uh, excuse me, May 28th, 1966. Um, and uh, they're uh, met and married in Mexico. So I'm a first generation American citizen. Uh, I am a son, a very proud son of Mexican immigrants. Um, so before I proceed with my own personal story, I want to talk a little bit about both my mom and my dad's story because that kind of lays the foundation to where I'm at now. So I'm going to start first with my mom's story. Now, um, she is the oldest child of eight children. Um, my grandparents are the two top people in that right-hand corner of the screen. Um, to kind of talk a little bit of the context of my mom and, and how she influenced where I'm at here today, I'll kind of explain a little bit of backstory of, of her and her life. So she was born in a small town called La Rosita Coahuila. Um, it's kind of you know pictured there in the map. It's kind of one of the northern states of Mexico. And... Um, uh, you know, being the oldest, obviously, she had to take on some additional responsibilities. If there's any older siblings in the audience, you know, especially for, you know, large families, you oftentimes become that uh, extra parental uh, person in the family, right? So, you know, being born in, in La Rosita, at that point, my grandfather, who um, uh, 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 was already crossing the border, uh, going into the United States, into Texas, primarily, as a migrant field worker, as a laborer, uh, you know, I always jokingly say wanted to decrease the commute time into the United States. So he decided to uproot his family. And, and part of that, he was already he was always also the oldest of his uh, of his family, he wanted to move them up closer to the border. Um, and so they, they, they found themselves moving to a town called Santa Elena, Chihuahua, Mexico. Now, the little canyon that you see there on the bottom right hand corner. Uh, if, uh, and I, you know, talking about being a native of West Texas, you know, this is kind of in the Big Bend region <clears throat> of the state. So if you ever had an opportunity to travel to Big Bend or camp or go hiking, it's a wonderful area. But uh, this was my my parents or my mom's back uh, backyard, essentially. You know, the, the canyon was just north of where she was raised primarily. And so uh, if you can notice the canyon on the right hand side of the canyon, it's the uh, United States on the left hand side. It's the it's Mexico and the, the Rio Grande River splits both of those, uh, both but with the canyon into two. Um, my grandfather there again, um, you know, uh, moving in and out of the United States, crossing the border uh, into, you know, for, for labor type of work, um, you know, you know, was able to earn some money, able to buy some land in Mexico. And he was able to kind of help support not only his own family, but, you know, brothers and sisters as well. And my mom being the oldest, there again, had to make a few sacrifices. Right. So she ended up going to the fourth grade. And ended up having to repeat the fourth grade three times. And it wasn't because of any sort of intellectual disability. Part of it is just because um, there was limitations. She could not go beyond the fourth grade in her little small rural town of Santa Elena. And, you know, by the time she repeated that third time, she was, you know, in her teenage years and close to her teenage years. And my grandfather finally told her, hey, Mika, you have to now start working with me. And so, you know, so she's, um, you know, made that sacrifice and was able to go work with him and as a migrant field worker herself. And so she um, I think that kind of really helped plant that seed of education. She just always loved education. And I always think imagine if she would have those opportunities that I was presented with as a young person. I could even have seen her become a teacher later on in life. Now, now I'm going to kind of move forward and talk a little bit about my my father's background. <clears throat> this is my great, or actually my grandmother. Um, uh, she was a single mother of seven children. 
And he was actually raised in a small little impoverished town called San Pedro, Chihuahua. And if you can look at the map, I don't know if you can see my uh, my arrow there. Uh, there's a little town called Coyame, and it's not even on most maps. I really haven't been able to find it on any maps that I could find uh, on the Internet. But it's located right off this river called the Rio Conchos. And um, he he was born into poverty, uh, essentially being the he was the fifth of, um, of like I said, of seven children. Uh, the second youngest male of the family. Um, he'd had to do some labor type of work. He was like a, a goat herder, a cattle herder he, for ranches around the area that he, he grew up in. Uh, my dad he had very limited resources. Um, he always would tell me that his first pair of shoes, he didn't get his first pair of shoes until he was 12 years of age. Uh, I would ask him, well, how'd you, what'd you do for your feet? Would he find leaves and cover them up with his feet? And, with his feet? and he had, I mean, eventually ended up enough money to buy a pair of shoes at the age of 12. And he would also provide money and support for his, his mom and some of the siblings was there as well. But as he got older, uh, his late teens, um, early 20s, uh, his older brothers and sister had already moved up closer to the border of Santa Elena, where my mom and, and my, gran my grandfather and grandmother were already living. And so my grandmother wanted to move closer to the rest of the family. So he ended up uh, moving close, uh, moving his mom and his two younger siblings up to the border as well. Now, my father there again um, would oftentimes at that point of his life also, you know, cross the border as a migrant field worker. And he kind of knew this whole West Texas region. He picked all sorts of, you know, fruit and vegetables from this region all the way up into the Southern Cal Colorado into, uh, you know, Southwest portion of Kansas. And I always kind of take, think that my dad is being kind of like Christopher Columbus with his family. He was the one that kind of discovered portions of Kansas for his family. And eventually he uprooted a lot of his brothers and sisters to move up to Kansas where there was some employment for them there. But he was also obviously had met the love of his life, my mom in Mexico. So he was having to, you know, meet, you know, talk to her. And eventually they got married and, and he crossed over. And, and quite honestly, he was an illegal immigrant for a big portion of his early life. Um, and, you know, as I proceed forward with my dad's story, I want to show you a, a kind of a slide here. Now, there was a program at that time called the, the Bracero Program. And that Bracero Program essentially was started in World War II in the early 1940s, and it kind of was ended in the JFK, the Kennedy administration, early 1960s. And what it was, the United States would contract labor work from, from Mexico in, in order to kind of work the fields and agricultural areas of the Southwest United States and uh, in, in California. And for the longest time, my dad would always talk about the braceros and, and being a bracero or, or working with the braceros. And then the day, the first day of his funeral, the viewing of, our, of his body, I was sitting in the back talking to one of my uncles and, and we were talking about the bracero program. And I brought this up and he goes, you know, Mijo, you're, 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 your, your dad wasn't a bracero, and I said, and I, and I was surprised by that this, for the longest time, and literally to the day he died, I thought he was a bracero, and he goes, no, Mico, you had to know how to read or write to be a bracero, so if you can see some of that photograph there, he had to sign documents, so until the day my dad died, he was illiterate, he didn't know how to read or write, uh, he learned how to sign his name, because my mom, there again, being one uh, uh, of an education mindset, was able to teach him how to, how to, how to sign his, his name for documents or checks and things of that sort that was required. And it was always funny to see him sign his name because he was left-handed, but he, my mom taught him how to do it in right, his right hand. And it was just scribble a few things there to be able to sign off on documents. And, 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 you know, and, and so part of that too is, you know, with him being an, also an illegal immigrant, you know, there's always this danger of being caught. So, you know, eventually um, my, my dad um, moved, at that point, my, this is my oldest brother here on the left-hand side. Uh, he was born in 1967, and he had moved up to the Kansas, my dad and my mom, because that's where his family was at, but then eventually moved back to my hometown of Fort Stockton, Texas, uh, because at that point, my grandfather and my mom's side of the family had moved into the United States because at that point, my grandfather had decided to sell all his land in, in Mexico in order to provide a better opportunity in life for, his, for, the, for my mom's younger brothers and sisters. And it was at that point in early 1968 in which my dad was finally caught as an illegal immigrant. And he was deported uh, into Mexico. Uh, he was deported into Juarez because that was the, the biggest uh, port uh, near, to, near near my little small hometown. And he was he was spent a few few weeks in the, in the El Paso County lockup. And then he was finally transported across the border 
without knowing anyone. You know, he said he had some distant family members that he could maybe rely upon. Um, and so for almost the entire year of 1968, he spent it, uh, uh, you know, sleeping in the streets, you know, sleeping on the floors of some distant relatives. And I always say through the grace of God and, and, um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, my mom's persistence, she was able to finally make him a legal resident in the United States. And so, you know, already had been selling in Fort Stockton. They, they bought that home. That's my childhood home. It's a uh, little small three bedroom house, about a thousand square square feet. And that's where I was kind of raised primarily uh, uh, throughout my, my younger years. Uh, I'm the little curly head fellow there in the middle. Those are my two older brothers there. Um, and so, you know, being raised in this type of environment, specifically with my mom, um, you know, uh, she was someone who was, you know, all about education, you know, and I quite honestly didn't know much English. So this is me in my first grade. And uh, I, you know, I was an ESL student, you know, I, had, I was English as a second language and you can't really tell my accent. I think I developed the Texas accent through time. But, um, you know, I was a shy kid, not the best student when I first started uh, off in, in my education, but um, I always laugh at this photograph because, uh, you know, not because of the glasses, but I don't know what my mom was thinking in regards to putting me a Pink Panther John Travolta T-shirt on picture day. Um, but, you know, being a part of my family, you know, these are some of the schools I went to there in Fort Stockton. I like to show this slide. Here's the library. We spent a lot of time in the library. My mom was all about making sure that we uh, used every resource possible um, in regards to our education. And, and there were always trips to the library. We use our library cards, summer reading programs at the library. And when my mom, not even knowing a, a word of English, we would read out loud the books that we would check out to her so she could hear us read. And I think that really played a, a good, important role in my life in regards to just, you know, one, ha having that foundation for the love of reading, but more important for my education. Now, as I proceeded and got into school, I started kind of excelling academically. I'm not going to lie to you, but I, you know, I credit more my mom than anything else just because as I, you know, I always jokingly tell my own kids and, and students I come across, if I brought home a 92 on a report card, she didn't pat me on the back. She would ask what happened to the other eight points. And, and you know, and because of that, you know, it really kind of, you know, pushed me to be the best student possible. But in spite of me being one of the better students in my class, you know, we start kind of differentiating yourself amongst your peers. I was one of a handful of, of, you know, they're getting first gen. You know, most of my peers at that point were were also very similar in my in my background, first generation students. And and there were some road hurdles, road hurdles there as well. You know, I remember clearly a conversation with my ninth grade English teacher, you know, when we started distinguishing ourselves and I wanted to be labeled as a gifted and talented student, you know, and and she told me, no, you are not gifted and talented. You are not up to speed with where everyone else is at, you know. And so you, these are things that, you know, instead of them breaking me down, it kind of helped motivate me kind of to move forward. Now, I'm going to kind of quickly go through this slide. So I don't want to make sure I have enough time to complete the presentation. So I always talk about equality and equity, right? You know, uh, you know, as being first gen, uh, people will kind of make that assumption that everything is equal. Well, it really isn't. You know, we're trying to find equitable resources, equitable discussions. And that's why I love uh, our, um, our, 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 this program particularly because we're providing those resources for you as well. Uh, this is a, a slide, you know, from, and a quote from Albert Einstein. There again, you know, a big proponent of diversity, big proponent of, um, of providing uh, educational resources for people of color in our country. Um, you know, one of the things that you're going to face as a first gen student are just obstacles, right? To, in, regard, in regards to being able to achieve that goal of becoming a physician, right? And, and unfortunately, there are a few things that are complete out of your hands, right? You know, if you come from a first gen generation or a first gen background, I should say, and you go from a, a school that's predominantly also first gen, there's going to be obviously some inadequacies sometimes in your education, right? There's going to be financial barriers, you know, uh, psychosocial factors where you grew up rural in your city that are going to perform impact your performance. And there might even be a lack of perceived uh, respect from from peers and colleagues as you go through this career track. This is me now. This is the cool guy looking here as me in high school when I graduated high school. But a few years prior to that, that's really when the, the seed of becoming a physician was planted in my head. My dad had, had been struggling with some chronic illnesses and finally caught up with them when I was in the eighth grade. He had a stroke. And it was during that time frame when to really kind of th I thought, start seriously thinking about wanting to become a physician. Um, and being the youngest of three boys and in my oldest brothers were eight and five years older than I am. So I was kind of left with my parents to kind of help translate for them in the hospital setting. And I, you know, I always say this, but in an arrogant way, but more so just because 
of my personal experiences, um, you know, I, I always say, you know, as the physicians and nurses would come in and, and talk to my parents, you know, they would kind of talk over your head. And, and I would think, you know, I can, one day I can do, I think I can do a better job of what they're doing in regards to providing information to my mom and my dad. And, and that kind of left me with that impression of saying, yeah, I want to be able to do that one day. So I graduated high school, came to Texas Tech, there's some beautiful pictures of my campus here. And, um, and there again, being first gen, I had no sort of sense of resources where to go. Uh, I'm so proud of this particular group here because I, uh, I've met Dr. Meeks, Dr. Robles, and Ricky, and I feel like we kind of all came in together around the TMDSS around the same time. And, and just really knowing the resources that are available to you all now, those weren't available, trust me, when I was coming through the system. And, um, and so you kind of had to learn a lot by yourself, right? And then, you know, also facing the, 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 the hurdles of who do you ask for letters of recommendation? And as I was, I was, I graduated with honors in chemical engineering and I was, I was asking one of my professors for a letter. He flat out told me, he goes, no, I don't think you're medical school material. So I had to kind of lean on other people to be able to kind of write those letters of recommendation. And I always say part of the problem with being first student is sometimes you don't have those role models, right? And so, but I was really fortunate enough in my life to come across two people who I really, that really truly inspired me. If there's any people in the audience from the Rio Grande Valley on the left-hand side, that's Dr. Leonel Vela. He was the founding dean of the UTRGV School of Medicine, and he was actually a faculty member at Texas Tech when I first met him. And, and he really was the one who inspired me to, yeah, you got to pursue this career track. You're, you're capable of doing it. Uh, the man on the, on the right-hand side, that's Dr. Bernard Harris. He was the first African-American to ever, uh, uh, walk in space, and he was a graduate from our medical school. And I had an opportunity to develop a pre-med society at Texas Tech underneath his name. And this is the, me a long time ago um, uh, at the opening ceremony of that. And these are two people that truly inspired me. Um, and so as I graduated uh, uh, from undergrad, this is some photographs of that, that those experiences, um, you know, being first gen, you know, there again, I, you know, I remember distinctly the conversation I had with my mom and my dad when I finally told me um, I was a chemistry major, chemical engineering major. And I told mom and dad, I really want to pursue a career in medicine. And I remember my dad's like, what? What are you thinking? You're crazy. You should have chosen medicine to begin with. And I said, no, dad, you have to go through your steps in order for you to graduate, right? You know, and you have to get an undergraduate. You have to get pro. And having to explain these things to them was, was a task, right? It was, it was difficult. But then I remember, you know, talking to them on, on, on a speakerphone. We didn't have cell phones back then and talking on the speakerphone. And I hear my mom's voice to this day when I'm having that conversation. She goes, Mijo, if it is in your heart, then it is your desire, then go for it. We're going to support you. And so, you know, I thank my mom wholeheartedly for that. But my dad finally turned around. I tell you what, when, when it did happen is when we I received the white coat and the white coat ceremony on the first day of a medical school and him being a part of the audience. You know, my dad, I could think of maybe two or three times in my life where he gave me a hug. And that was one of the days that he gave me a hug. And I remember that that day distinctly. But as I moved into medical school, I, I always I came into medical school during kind of, and I'm not going to go through all the details of the slide for time's sake, but under the cloud, it was called the Hopwood case. At that moment in time, there was no kind of affirmative action policies. There wasn't anything uh, that was involved in that, right? And so, you know, real quickly, enrollment for people of color just substantially decreased uh, across not only law school, but medical schools as well. So when I came into medical school, and I have you, this is my graduating class in med school, I'm going to have you count with me. So there was one, two, three, four, five, and six people of, of underrepresented backgrounds being a Latino or Hispanic. And there were no African-American students in my graduating class back in 2003. But things changed. Obviously, the, the, the court system upheld uh, the, the firm action policies and things have changed and gotten for hopefully for, for the better. But as I graduated medical school, I found my true passion in, in family medicine. And um, I completed residency. I was the chief resident of our department. And one of the things on my bucket list was to go practice medicine in a rural area. So I had the honor and privilege of practicing in a little small town called Friona, Texas. This is the hospital in the background. And this is some of the staff and nurses that I got a chance to work with uh, while, when I was there. And, and there again, I, you know, I practiced full spectrum from the tomb to the womb. I took care of babies, delivered babies, ER thing. I did, I did it all. I really loved my career there. And, um, but, you know, I, I didn't ever saw that as a stepping stone. I kind of saw that as an opportunity for me for growth. And then uh, I was really fortunate that um, I was invited to come back as a faculty member here at Texas Tech. Um, um, and uh, it, my, my chairman invited me to come back. And I could not pass up the opportunity to, one, teach, but also mentor young people as they're pursuing careers in medicine. 
And one of the things that kind of left me when I was in Friona, because when we got to Friona, my wife was a little concerned about going to a small rural town. She's from El Paso, Texas, from a big, large metropolitan area, right? And and um, but as we left, she fell in love with the area too. And she told me, I remember this clear day when we were leaving. She goes, you know, one you were like the Jackie Robinson of, of Friona, Texas. And I said, you don't don't compare me to such a uh, legendary figure. I don't need, I'm not even in the same breath. And she goes, no, because one day you're going to inspire someone from this town to become a physician. And, you know, so anyhow, apologize. So as I got into my academic career, you know, there are terms and phrases that, that have impacted my life without even me even knowing exactly what these definitions are from implicit bias, lack of inclusiveness, microaggressions, lack of equity, stereotype threat. These are these terms and terminology that I had to learn as a faculty member. I was like, hey, I, I face these things. And these are things you guys are going to have to face as first generation students, right? But I will tell you this, why is it important for you to continue this career track, right? And and in part of it is because by 2045, the United States will be a minority majority country, right? You know, if you look at the data, you know, specifically for those who are in Latino in the audience, you know, the population has grown by 243% since 1980. But unfortunately, there's been a lack of 22% during that same time for physicians, right? And always, there's three numbers that always stick in my head in regards to those who are from the Latino or Latino X type of community, 17, 7, and 3. 17% of the population is Latino. 7% are just of uh, the, the, the United States uh, physicians are Latino, but only 3% are in academic medicine. Why is it so important to have these seminars, right? Why is it so important to discuss diversity in terms of first gen? Well, believe it or not, study after study after study will show that um, uh, the patients will choose physicians who look like them, who can speak the same language, even if it's just a limited fluency, right? And so, the, and, and, and what is, why does that matter? For me in admissions, why does that matter? It matters because we're trying to create a population of physicians that looks like the community that we're gonna treat in the future. And ultimately those are gonna provide better patient outcomes at the end of everything, right? You know, why are, is it beneficial to talk to students of first gen and, and try to talk about diversity? One is, you know, people of color, African-American, Hispanic physicians are oftentimes gonna serve those underserved communities and not speaking uh, areas uh, uh, help more underserved, um, uh, underfunded, underserved Medicaid type of patients. If there's anything the pandemic taught us is the need for more physicians like that because people of color were devastated during the pandemic. Now, I want to leave you with some words of wisdom here before I come off, right? So I always say at every stage of your learning, if you're a high school or a college student, a medical student, be engaged, all right? Because you never know when someone's going to write that future letter recommendation. Uh, continuously improve your communication skills, right? Your reading, your writing, your public speaking, because most reprimands from medical schools are not academic in nature, oftentimes from a lack of communication. Be mentally tough, you know, be goal oriented, be passionate about what you're doing and also make positive choices and really, really choose your friends wisely, right? Why is that important? Back in the day when I was younger, my mom used to tell me, dime quiénes son tus amigos y diré quién eres tú. Tell me who your friends are and I can tell you who you are. Uh, this is a wonderful story called The Pack. If you have an opportunity to read this book, I would highly recommend it. It's about three African-American young men, high school students, and eventually got into undergrad. And that two of them went to medical school, one into dental school, that they formed these tight bonds, but they saw each other. So make sure you're choosing your friends while those are going to support your journey as a first-gen student through this career track. This is my personal pack. Um, you, know, you know, I grew up in impoverished. And most of these gentlemen on this picture did the same. But because our, our pact and our dedication to each other, you're not seeing people who gave up in life. You're seeing a, a PhD in material science, a football coach. I'm the physician, a music educator, a geologist, and a border patrol agent because of our families and how we work together. You know, live each day have something that inspires you. This is my family. This is my daily inspiration. You live for something bigger than yourself. Remember to be passionate, be determined, and have faith in yourself, okay? And why is all this discussion so important to me? Why? Because one day, this is one of the last photographs my, my, my dad took. If you notice, he has two, two legs at the time. He ended up last years of his life having double amputations of both his feet. He spent the last 
you know, seven years of his life hooked to a dialysis machine every every other day. And maybe one day someone in this audience can have the impact to be able to communicate to my dad. I wasn't able to do that as a son, but maybe someone in this audience will be able to communicate to patients like my dad. So you can stop the suffering that, that my dad had to suffer, go through. So why is this also important to me? Because I've been, I've had the honor and the privilege through the JAMP program, through my medical school training, to be able to mentor young people of color, but be also other people of all races and ethnicities and i'm so proud of each and every one of them because they have all become very successful in their lives and their careers and and it's just been just been an honor to do that and i end up with a couple more slides here this is the candy once again you know and i always say whatever road hurt or whatever river whatever mountain is put in front of you you fight on you continue fight the good fight make sure you're going and, and make sure you're doing the best you can to move forward in life right because I am not here today without the, the love and the support of the, these two people. I stand on the shoulders of giants each and every day. So thank y'all so much. I apologize for the tears, but thank y'all so much for allowing me to speak here today. Thank you, Dr. Morales, for sharing such an intimate um, life story about you and your family and your journeys. Um, it's it's you're both very inspiring and a role model for other first gen students who, you know, may share similar stories and who are also seeking the path to higher education. So I'm very humbled to hear your words and your story and to see how your story evolves and continue um, as you and I, you know, continue to work together. <laughs> exactly. So thank you for that. Thank you, Josh. So as um, as we move forward uh, through tonight's seminar, I'd like to share a little bit about the Joint Admission Medical Program or JAMP. Um, J-A-M-P for short. Um, our mission uh, is to support students from economically dis disadvantaged backgrounds um, from across the state of Texas. So if you're in Texas, if you're in Texas, you know, you may want to, you know, give us a phone call or an email um, uh, someday soon. Um, but we help these uh, Texas students successfully matriculate uh, into medical school and pursue a career in medicine. Um, there are several benefits to being part of the JAMP program, um, but ultimately we help students get into medical school um, and help close the gap for success and remove any kind of barriers um, students face along the way. Um, for the sake of time, um, you know, I know there are many benefits I would love to share, but for the sake of time, I will only highlight three major um, opportunities and benefits that students receive um, from JAMP or alongside JAMP. So the first is the MCAT. Um, the first major benefit of being a JAMP student is uh, preparation um, in a three-phase uh, uh, program that focuses on the, the medical college admission test or the MCAT um, test for short. So this is an entrance exam that students need to take to get into medical school. Um, the first phase of, um, I guess the first phase of this program uh, focuses on critical analysis and, and reasoning skills enrichment or CARS enrichment. Um, the second phase in, uh, involves science enrichment in biology and chem and chemi in general chemistry. And the third involves uh, third phase involves uh, weekly live online sessions. Um, this whole all three phases take place uh, or the MCAT, MCAT preparation takes place throughout um, students time in the JAMP program. Um, during the academic school year and during summer internships. So the second uh, major benefit of being a JAMP student is the opportunity to participate in two summer internship programs at one of JAMP's participating medical schools. Um, during the uh, JAMP internships, JAMP students receive opportunities for preceptorships, clinical enrichment, medical school level um, classes such as anatomy and physiology, biochemistry, medical ethics, um, and a whole bunch of other exciting experiences. Um, so that's definitely something students look forward to um, who, who uh, is to spend st uh, summers at these internships. Um, the last and most exciting, in my opinion, um, benefit is that, you know, JAMP students, you know, um, receive guaranteed admission to a participating Texas medical school if they meet all JAMP eligibility criteria. Um, so there are certain criteria that students will need to meet and maintain throughout the JAMP program. 
Um, but if they are successful, then um, students are guaranteed a spot at a participating Texas medical school. So if you'd like to know more, um, you're welcome to you know, shoot us an email, give us a phone call. Um, our contact information is on the next slide. Um, so feel free to reach out. Our team is happy to assist in, you know, with any kind of questions or concerns um, you have. Uh, so just you know, give us a phone call um, and we're happy to help you. So now <clears throat> um, I'm happy to, to move on, uh, forward to the next exciting session that we have for tonight. Um, but before um, we begin, I'd like to offer some useful information on what we can expect from our first gen uh, panel, uh, beginning with a smaller, a small reminder um, of how we define and how we understand the term first generation. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I just want to take a uh, take pause real quick to kind of uh, spend a little time on on gaining a grasp uh, for for those who may not know what first gen is or may want to grow their understanding of what first gen is. Um, I have just some a few. Uh, facts here that I hope that kind of can kind of get us refreshed with what first gen means. Um, and I hope that it, it benefits us as we move forward through the through the panel discussions and you know as we move forward in our own um, career and education pathways. So the that's the the Center for First Gen Student Success uh, defines um, a first generation college student as those who are the first in their family to attend college. Um, other programs, uh, such as uh, TRIO programs, use the, the federal definition, um, which is a, a student coming from a family uh, where their biological parents did not complete a four-year college degree. Um, you know, despite what definition you focus on, it's important to kind of identify those central elements, right? We are the first to attend some type of higher education credential. Um, so keep that in mind as we, as we move forward. Um, you know, in the United States, you know, one in every three college students are classified as first generation. Um, and that's around the country. So that's, that's a lot of students if you think about it, right? Uh, then in the context of the number of first generation medical school students, uh, the, the AAMC or the Association of American Medical Colleges um, estimate around 12% of medical students who began medical school in the 2021-2022 academic school year identify as first generation um, college students, which was nearly a 2% increase from the 2018-2019 academic school year. Isn't that some fo interesting food for thought? So as we continue to move forward with our panel this evening, please keep this information in mind as we engage in conversations, um, as ultimately we hope they can offer deeper insight into what the journey toward medical school looks like for a first generation college student. With that said, I would like to go ahead and take a minute to introduce our panelists uh, for tonight. Um, if I may kindly ask uh, our panelists, I guess beginning with Nayeli, um, to unmute their mics one at a time and share your name, where you call home, and um, we, can go, we can go to the next slide. Share uh, where you call home, um, share if you are a student or parent, and what you like to do for fun. Also, if you are a medical student panelist, if I may kindly ask to also share what schools you went to, um, you know, high school, undergraduate colleges, what medical school you're currently enrolled in, and what year you are in your program. Um, so I, I, on this slide, we'll keep it here for now so that we can re be reminded of what we got to share. Uh, but I'm happy to hear where everyone's from and um, as we continue to move forward. So. Nayeli, if you, may, if you may please start. Yes, um, so my name is Nayeli Fuentes. Um, Mount Pleasant is my hometown. It's a small town in Northeast Texas. Um, for fun, I like to read, run, and watch Netflix. Um, I'm currently a third year medical student at, here at Texas Tech in Lubbock. I'm in my third year of medical school. I went to college at Texas A&M in Commerce, Texas, um, and yeah. I enrolled in medical school. I started medical school um, in 2020. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing. I don't know if you want a popcorn um, to someone else. You're welcome to do that. 
I'll popcorn to Allison. All right, Allison. Hey everyone, um, I'm Allison. I'm a third year medical student at Texas Tech at Lubbock as well. Um, Nayeli and I are actually in the same class. Um, I was born and raised in Houston. I attended the University of St. Thomas for undergrad, and that's also in Houston. And I, what I do for fun is I like to go on hikes and swim. And I would like to popcorn Kendall. Allison, one second. Where Did you uh, tell us where high schools, colleges went to, uh, uh, what, what year you're in? Yes, third year okay. medical student, and I went to the University of St. Thomas in okay, Houston. You're awesome. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is Kendall Wermine. I was a part of the JAMP class for the entering year of 2017. I am from a really small town, like population 800 people. Hardly anybody's heard of it, but it's called Lakewood Village, Texas. Um, it's like right outside of Little Elm, if you know that small town. For fun, I like to work out and I like to swim and I go to school in Galveston, so I like to go to the beach. Um, I'm a student panelist, so I attended John Paul II Catholic High School in Plano. My parents didn't really get an education, so they sent us about an hour away to school every day because it was really important to them. And then after high school, I attended Abilene Christian University, and I'm currently at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, now named the John Seeley School of Medicine. So I just carry a long list of names with me, and I'm a fourth year, so I'll be applying to residency this fall. And I'll popcorn to Miss Veronica. Hello, um, I'm Veronica Keaton Barker. I um, am a parent. And I have a Texas parent support group uh, for parents to give, help them um, help their students with information. I have a student who is a second year medical student now at Long Medical School and um, happy to be here. I live near Austin, Texas, and I guess what I like to do for fun is help other people. All right. Thank you each of you so much for sharing a little bit about you. Um, I'm excited to learn more uh, with our guiding uh, panel questions we have tonight. Um, before we get started asking the most exciting questions we have for y'all, I'd like to share just a little housekeeping um, uh, regarding our, our audience engagement. So um, what I'm hoping to do for, uh, as we move forward is to really highlight the, you know, the central questions we have uh, planned for y'all. Um, which I, I you should already have received, um, just to kind of explore, you know, a more focused exploration of what the, your experiences have looked like. Um, for our audience, if you have any kind of questions um, or comments, um, we have a behind the scenes crew. Um, Enrique will be helping us uh, kind of filter and see, you know, which questions, you know, we should raise or any kind of comments um, that could be added to the conversation um, as we continue to have this dialogue. Um, so, you know, audience, feel free to, you know, ask questions, whatever you have, um, and we're happy to uh, address them as as soon as possible after we've kind of uh, addressed the initial uh, the initial set of questions. So, um, now that we've covered that that housekeeping, let's begin our our conversation um, with the first question for our panel. On the next slide, please. So we'll be discussing uh, what it means to be a first generation, you know, certain challenges and barriers that, that we may have experienced. Um, you know, we'll discuss resources and best practices, balancing school, home, and work life, um, as well as, you know, advice for the next generation or the future generation of medical students, of, of first-gen medical students. Um, so let's go ahead and open this dialogue. Can we uh, get the next slide, please? All right, so for our panelists, um, what does being a first-gen college student or a parent of one mean to you? And there's no order, you know, you can chime in whenever you feel, just let us know what you think. I, I can start their conversation. Um, so honestly, growing up, I have a younger sister who's like a year younger than I am. Uh, my parents kind of expected a lot from me. Um, so my parents are like working class. Uh, we grew up kind of like just outside in the suburbs in Houston. We didn't have like a lot to, to go off of. My parents did not speak a lot of English. So um, 
most of the things like they rely on me to do um, growing up. So like, I don't know if anybody can relate, but sometimes they have to call the doctor office or like call the insurance or call like certain providers or services. And they'd be like, can you translate for me? Um, so I think that's like always been tough. And I always like question like, oh, why do I need to do that? Or like, why am I the first person to figure everything out in the family? Um, it is a struggle. I think um, now at my at the stage I am now, I feel very like blessed because it's nice that I knew what was going on and was able to help my parents, help my sister kind of pave the path for, I guess, our generation, my generation. Um, so I think it's hard, but it's gone easier um, as I kind of like learn the ways and like make friends and have good mentors and things like that. All right. Thank you for sharing. Who would like to uh, share next? Just going based off of what um, Allison said, I mean, I completely resonate with what she um, shared, but also just like the way I see it is like my parents, you know, immigrated from the U.S., from Mexico, um, you know, in, in order to give me and my siblings a better future, right? So like I'm first gen, I'm here, but by um, getting an education, by going after a degree and um, establishing myself and helping other first gens along the way, we're making sure that we're not only setting our, ourselves up for, for success, but like setting the future generations up for success. So making sure that my kids are going to have opportunities that I didn't have and that my parents didn't have and making sure that my family, my friends, and like I said, anyone else that's coming after me, um, that, that I can help them in any way. So I think being first gen has really like just been in, in, you know, in the back of my mind throughout my entire journey from high school to college now in med school and just never forgetting that that's, you know, that's my identity. That's part of who I am and being proud of that and making sure that I showcase that so that like, people, like I said, that are coming after me know that um, they're not alone. I, I, I was never alone. I had other first gens um, that also helped me get here. So I think it's just a really beautiful community. And I think that it's just, um, it's just something that I think about often, even now in medical school, because it's, um, I think it's just really special that we all kind of identify with each other in one way or another, and we're able to help each other, lift each other up, um, and again, keep, keep going towards uh, reaching our goals. Thank you, Nayeli. I think that's powerful, especially when you highlight, you know, the finding that sense of community and 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 uh, support in that community. That's that's powerful. Who would like to go next? I can go. Um, so being a first generation student to me, it's kind of like a double sided sword. There's going to be parts of it that are great due to the community and everything else. But there's also going to be struggles, which I know we'll talk about challenges later. Um, but having that support system through the struggles is really amazing. And then my motto is to lift as you climb. Uh, and I'll probably talk about it a little bit later. But at UTMB, I actually started an organization for first gens. And now it's the largest one on campus. And we do it as, OK, this is our fourth year class. What are we experiencing? And how can we make the first gens in the class below us have an easier time? They'll still face challenges. but. The whole point is to make it easier on the people that come after you. And it's really great because your family gets to see like you living out your dreams. My parents, like I always knew that I wanted to be a doctor and they were like, are you sure? Like that's a lot of school. And I was always like, yes. And now I'm doing it. And so you really feel like this is where you're supposed to be when you finally get to the end of it. During it, you can feel a little bit like run down, like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? But if you have the the drive to be a physician, I think like if you're first gen, that only makes you almost better in a way because you really have experienced a lot of healthcare in a way different than most. That's awesome. Thank you, Kendall. You're doing a good work. I like that you uh, established an organization, you know, to give, to pay forward, right, and to help the next gen of, of students, you know, the next cohort, the next era um, of students. Um, that's awesome. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Who would like to go next? What does being first gen mean to you? Or being a parent? I can talk <laughs> a little bit about being a parent. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, technically, I'm not a first-gen parent, but I 
work with a lot of first gen parents in my parent group who have absolutely no idea what it means. First of all, you know, the intricacies of all the application process of going into medical school. So the terminology is, you know, above and beyond what they even can comprehend and the time commitment. So what we try to focus on is the support and the education and how to support your student. Um, there's just so much involved and a lot of times they don't understand how much of a time and financial commitment it is to get involved in so many clubs, organizations, um, jobs, being away from your family and not always being able to go home. Um, and then when the students need the support during the MCAT process and also the whole application process, when it's great to, you know, just be that pat on the back or just, you know, say, yay, you know, you pass that class and not, you know, worry about those seven points that they missed, um, as Dr. Morales was talking about earlier. <laughs> so it's just being a first gen parent has, I think, unique challenges. Um, to our group that we have special support for. Definitely. Thank you, uh, Veronica, for sharing. I think um, uh, each of you kind of raised a, 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 a good point about, you know, how this, what it means to be first gen is beyond just the individual and in many cases is beyond just the family. Um, it's really a collective effort, right? A, a collective understanding, you know, of having to go through these First gen um, adversities and trials, and you know, um, you know, to get through it, you know, but not not on our own, right? But with a, a collective effort, with a collective support system um, along the way. So that's you know, which I'll shared so far has been beautiful. Do any of y'all have any um, uh, remarks as we move forward um, to the next question? No. All right then. So our next our next question is um, what challenges or barriers have you faced or may continue to face um, as a first gen college student um, or parent of a first gen student on the medical school journey? I can start us off on this one. Um, so one thing I would say is the hidden curriculum. So I started in JAMP and we met with Dr. Mr. Hermes Meyer. And one of the things he said is a lot of times medic medicine can seem like it's by the rich and for the rich. And a JAMP program helps to change that by bringing people from lower socioeconomic status um, into the medical field. And that really resonated with me, but it truly didn't hit me until I got to medical school and realized almost half my class have physicians for parents. So they kind of, they knew what they were getting into. And I didn't. I still love it. I love medicine. I wouldn't change anything. But there's definitely a hidden curriculum. And there's a lot about who do you know in coming from a first gen background. The only doctor I ever knew was the one that I would see for a PCP if I saw them. Um, and so getting to medical school, I think one thing that is super important is finding mentorship. And there's so many good first gen mentors. And they and so if you reach out to them, they are very receptive. And so I think that's a way to combat it. But I'd say the biggest challenge and barrier is that hidden curriculum. And then an additional thing is the cost associated. Because for JAMP, they're amazing. They help pay for the MCAT um, courses. The MCAT's also expensive, but there's like fee um, forgiveness or like they help with it. Um, medicine, when you have to do like your practice, tests, it costs money for each one. And then additionally, your exams go from being like $300 for the MCAT to almost 700. And then there's the next in there longer. So one of the tests that I'll be coming up for the licensing exam is 19 hours long. Those are things I didn't know. I wouldn't go back and change anything, but I probably would have spent less time shopping. So yeah. All right. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, the hidden curriculum. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, I can imagine, especially for first-gen students. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Kendall, for sharing. I would, um, sorry, Josh, I'm not sure if you were going to keep talking, but I would just go ahead and expand that, what Kendall said, and, and not just with medical school expenses, but like in everyday life, right? So like I'm first-gen, and um, I also come from a low-income family. I have seven siblings. My dad's the only one that works to this day, you know? Um, and that's because my mom has to take care of my younger sibling. So like, I don't have the best car, right? Like I don't have a 
Mercedes or BMW. And I'm okay with that because I have what my parents have always given me the best that they can give me. Um, but it's like, you know, when my car breaks down, I have to be like, oh, you know, what can we do? Because I know that my sister's car also broke down. And I know that my parents are struggling financially and my brother is about to go to college. So, you know, like thinking about those stressors on top of what Kendall said of school and like the the um, step exams and all the tuition and costs that come with it. Um, and then also just like, you know, I come from a very... Um, pretty much like Mexican-American household where my mom would cook like my favorite Mexican food every day and moving to Lubbock seven hours away from home. You know, I don't have like my my safe food, my cold for food that like kind of connects me. And so it's like, I have to learn and provide that for myself. And um, it just kind of, I think uh, some of the biggest challenges would just be like being so far away from home and being truly like independent and, and learning how to, um, be comfortable with yourself, but also not let go of your culture and not let those stressors, like I said, like those financial burdens get to you while also dealing with everything that med school throws at you. Um, so I think just um, knowing that as a first gen um, and as a low income student, just knowing that I always have my family, knowing that I have, like I said, like, you know, the JAM program, like Kendall mentioned, helps immensely, even in med school. Um, and even here, like some of the other med students that are first gen or jampers or um, also come from low income households that we all kind of know what we're going through, um, even though some of our other classmates might not know. So I think that's been um, one of the biggest things, just kind of um, dealing with all these other financial um, issues or burdens that have come up across the way, but also learning how to be like, all right, like, you know, I am going to be a doctor one day. Um, I am going to have income that perhaps my parents didn't have. And so I'll be able to pay off loans. I'll, I'll be able to buy a better car. Um, and so just kind of relying on that. And again, using that as a motivation to not let um, all these stressors kind of get to me and um, get in the way, of, you know, pursuing my education and, and finishing it. Thank you, Nayeli, for sharing. I think you raised uh, one, one point that really, really resonated with me. And it was just that this idea that we can't lose sight of of who we are you know because you know whether it be the hidden curriculum whether it be our our financial status whether it be you know um homesickness like we we can often get blinded right by why are we here you know and what what's what's our why are we on this path so it's you know it's important to continue having this discussion with ourselves of you know our purpose why we're doing this you know for reasons that are often beyond us right and um it's I, i'm really um Humble to hear that. So thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. Who else would like to share? Um, I guess I can go. Um, I also agree with what Nayeli and Kendall mentioned. Um, more so on the fact that there is some sort of like hidden curriculum. I think going into med school, I didn't um, know like everything about med school, like the curriculum, what we had to attend, things we had to know. And when I was looking at my like other friends who, you know, their parents are physicians, you kind of realize like, oh, I, I didn't grow up like this. I don't know what this means. Like, I don't, I didn't realize this test was gonna be 19 hours long. I didn't realize we had to pay 650 for a test um, for like our board exam. So I think things like that has always been a challenge. Um, it's, it's fun sometimes because it comes as a surprise. Um, but as you, like Nagali mentioned, like as you go through it, it gets a little easier. And then, you know, our goal in the end is to make it easier for first generation students who come after us um, to kind of like know these things. We, we want to pave that path for them. I'm happy that you uh, shared that, Allison. Thank you. Um, again, I think this idea of the hidden curriculum, which is a very real thing, right? Um, and who has access to the hidden curriculum? Um, um, you know, and uh, but also I want to highlight that when we explore that, when we ex encounter these things, um, it can these hidden curriculum items, right, or experiences, it can often bring up feelings of uncertainty or discomfort, um, especially for first gen students. So it's, you know, it's um, just I just want you to know that this is those are valid feelings to have, you know, but that going back to this idea of like a collective effort of support, a collective uh, system of support, um, just always feel free to reach out to your support systems and, you know, ask for help, ask for answers to the hidden 
you know, those questions that the hidden curriculum um, throws at you. So uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'd be happy to chime in as a parent. Um, thank you, Veronica. No problem. Some of, I think that the challenges and barriers, um, and I think it maybe even caused some friction between the parents and the students is, is not knowing the time investment and the finances um, and when it's okay to, to offer help and when it's not okay. And, you know, the boundary between the student and, you know, overstepping and appearing like a helicopter parent and knowing when to get involved. Um, not having, I guess, any sort of knowledge, like most of these students, you know, when the students are going to need the money, you're so focused on, you know, okay, these are the things they're going to need in college, but not knowing there's all these additional things on the side that they're going to need, you know, studying for MCAT prep or like clothes to wear to go to shadow or, you know, how to get a clinical job, like who do I know or how can I help them get shadowing and things like that. Um, and then, of course, they're doing a lot of these things on the time that you expect them to come home and visit during the holidays um, or even on a weekend. And they really need to study for that OCHEM test or something. Um, those are the kinds of things I think as parents we struggle with and, and not knowing, you know, having been down that road before where to where it's OK and where it's not. Um, so that's something I think a lot of parents, I mean, that have never been down that road struggle with. You raise a very, very, very important um, perspective of of what this experience could look like from a parent um, from, a, from a parent's lens, and I definitely want to highlight, you know, this idea of how do we as parents, you know, establish healthier boundaries with our students, you know, who um, have their own set of challenges, um, and how how do we really um, say it's okay you know to fall into this type of vulnerability and sharing what's what, what's going on right and and how do parents and how do students you know adopt this reciprocal um validation right like hey mom like i know i know you're struggling too with with funding you know with with finances or whatever that those challenges may look like right but also um creating those micro spaces of saying like hey i'm here you know, I'm here as your as your student, or hey, I'm here as your parent. Just know that I'm that lifeline that you can reach out to when you want to find, you know, those non tangible affirmations, right, and and support. So I think that's beautiful, and and I, I appreciate you for for sharing that. Um, I, I could go on all night, but I want to go ahead and move on to the next question. Uh, the next question we have for y'all is um, what resources, initiatives, um, programs, um, and or you know individual practices, um, which, you know, what helped you mediate or work through uh, the challenges you mentioned uh, previously? I think for me, um, I would like to kind of highlight three programs or organizations that I joined, one being the JAMP program, um, just, you know, being surrounded by students that just kind of know, understand, and are going to be doctors. Um, just kind of be surrounded by those and being mentored by students in the JAM program just kind of helped me a lot during my undergrad and during my transition into medical school. And then once in medical school, um, I was selected uh, to be part of the free clinic leadership team here in Lubbock. Um, and that just, you know, again, being surrounded by a team that's, that understands about the importance of helping patients that are uninsured, that are maybe undocumented, that don't have a secure place to live, that don't have a car, um, you know, some physicians, unfortunately, I feel like, and even medical students maybe pursue the career for different reasons. And so just kind of knowing that there are students here and classmates that truly care about helping those that are the most vulnerable um, in our community. I think just sharing thoughts, having discussions, especially when the political climate is just, you know, going through a lot of changes. Um, I think that's helped me a lot. Um, and also being far away from home again, um, I think that that support system really helped me. And then just the last one being um, the Dean's Ambassador Program here at Tech, um, who's actually, we're actually under the um, Office of Admission, so under Dr. Morales, and just having him, you know, constantly speak and, and talk to us and talk to um, interviewees when they come and apply to our school. 
um, I think it's just really inspirational hearing Dr. Morales' story and it just resonates with me a lot because I'm also first gen daughter of immigrants. My parents, you know, came from Mexico. Um, and so it's just so inspiring to see him, you know, be an, be, be himself, be an authentic first gen um, um, male here doctor, just kind of killing it at our school and doing the best that he can to help us first gens that are kind of trying to follow in his footsteps. Um, I don't think any other medical school that I interviewed at um, in Texas had a dean that was that passionate about supporting first gens. And that's one of the things that drew me to tech. Um, so I think just those three programs and organizations have helped me a lot and have helped me kind of feel like I, I belong here. I'm here to stay. And I'm also here to help and um, raise anyone else and, and help them also get into JAMP or get into medical school and become a doctor. Thank you, Nayeli. That was awesome. I love how you really focused on three main uh, programs um, and experiences that you had on your way to medical school um, that really, you know, solidified your, your belief like, hey, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a physician. That's I think that's awesome. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Nayeli. Who would like to go next? I can go next. So one of the resources slash initiatives, I actually started because um, I got to UTMB and I was talking to Dr. Perez. Um, she's one of our deans about just advising and things like that. And I asked her, is there anything for first generation students? And she said, no. And I was like, OK, well, would you sponsor me if I started one? And she said, yes. And since then, it grew from my one like little loan idea to now we have over 375 members across schools and across faculty. Um, so previous physicians, they come back and help. But the main reason was to explore that hidden curriculum. So we taught first gen students and we continue to teach them how to get involved in research, how to find good mentors, what mentorship actually looks like, how to deal with financial aid, because myself, financial aid can be a huge thing to understand. And if there's certain ways that can help save you money, certain loans with less interest. And a lot of times if you're first generation, you just don't know about it. And so I wanted our students that come in and myself included to learn from these talks and be able to pass it down. And so now they're talks that happen every year. And then we thought, okay, how can we do this more? And so we lead first generation students mentoring younger students. So the third years to the second years, the second years to the first years over the different courses that they'll be taking, how to succeed, how to study in those courses. And then on top of that, this year I started a program through First in the Family called Specialty Speed Dating. And what we do is we bring in first generation physicians to teach the second and first year students different tasks that they'll need while on that clinical service in their third year. So we've run suture clinics, we've done the birthing simulators. So we've had quite a few students come in and learn how to actually do a birth on a mannequin. And so they birth out a little mannequin baby and then they start the whole process over again. We've done abscess drainages and everything. So it really helps the first gen students here understand that hidden curriculum. And additionally, we set up a mentorship program where students get to mentor other students in different grades. And we also have faculty mentors. And our president at UTMB, Dr. Raymer, he's first gen and he loves the organization and will speak at it every year to tell us about his story as a first gen. And he's mentored quite a few of our students and is writing some of them rec letters for their residency application. So that would be the one initiative I started. And I and I know it's going to continue on um, because there's different students in it from each year. And I've already like handed it over to the second years and then the third years. So I'm very excited about that. And I think it's a great program that we're trying to get other schools to take up to. Wow, Kendall, I am blown away. I think that is awesome. Awesome. I know you mentioned it earlier, but I'm happy you were able to unpack you know, what this organization does you know, in, in more detail. Um, I think this is a true testament to how we, as some as first gen, you know, med students can really advocate in in more than one on one ways, right? More than just one on one mentorships, but at a structural level, right? Like this organization is is beyond you, is beyond us just now. It's it's three hundred plus members, and you've really created you know your own little legacy, right? Of what of what giving forward. Um, for first gen med students looks like right and i think that's awesome i think that's you're, you're doing great work and uh um my own little 
two cents here. I would love to meet maybe off camera or, you know, over coffee or something to talk more about the program. Uh, I would love to, you know, learn more about it and just to maybe, maybe even be part of an event sometime. But um, thank you for sharing. Anyone else? I'm glad to say what we've done for parents. Um, just because there wasn't a whole lot out there specifically for taxes, there's a few, a couple of parent support groups out there. Um, and because my child was going through this and I had absolutely no clue what to do, I guess the first thing I did was plug myself into any parent group about any medical school to learn anything. And then, of course, um, joined the TMDSAS support, signed up for the Texas Health Education Services newsletters to just kind of absorb as much as I could. So that way I could understand, you know, financially time wise, OK, this is when she might need a good sum of money to start applying or, you know, this is when she might need clothes for interviews. Um, and then some of the things that she would have to get involved in. So I created this Texas parents group which has a lot of terminology in one section just so parents can go through. We have a lot of videos, um, some live Q and A's that we've done with Enrique in the past um, that he goes through kind of like anatomy of an applicant um, just to kind of give parents that. And then we have probably a good 50 at least parents who are parents of medical students now who've progressed and you know graduated and they're, some of them are actually just graduated this past year and are now in their residency that are there to mentor other parents who have absolutely no idea. They're free to ask questions at any time for any situation. No question is a dumb question. And we're just all there for parental support. So if you have a question as a parent, um, feel free, drop in, ask your question, and we'll be happy to help. Veronica, thank you. That is so amazing. Um, I think you really shine light on this whole other dimension of what advocacy can look like, right, um, in action. Um, I think that's so important to highlight as well. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to what we kind of uh, mentioned earlier, this idea of community support, right? Community support, yes, is beyond, or collective support is beyond the individual, is beyond the family unit. It, it extends to our schools, to our communities, to other education institutions, to student organizations, and it's so multidimensional. And I think it's, it's, it's great to talk about uh, but we really thank you so much for highlighting that that dimension of what parent advocacy, advocacy can look like in action. You're awesome. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I think the biggest thing regarding having some things like that you can rely on to go through these challenges is to have an outlet to discuss these matters. Um, Besides the things that Nayeli mentioned, you know, support groups in schools, things you're um, involved in at school or even mentoring programs, I think finding a good mentor you can confide in, as in like an already established physician who is who could be first gen or not, um, someone you can talk to and kind of guide you through that process. Um, I know here at Tech, we um, did have a program where you would you could follow a physician for a year long and you kind of just see how it goes you meet them like once or twice a month um, you follow them throughout clinic you ask any questions if you had questions about you know residency um, questions about school questions about how did you deal with having school and work or school and a kid um, things like that i thought uh, was really helpful um, and really the important thing is having someone you can have an honest conversation with um, because sometimes I feel like not everyone is open fully. And if you are struggling or um, needing a lot of help, I think having a really well knowledge, um, well rounded uh, mentor, a physician, or a faculty at school is really helpful um, because they've been through that journey. You know, if you, um, so like for myself, I in the future would like to be, finish, you know, my medical school, be a physician, and also in the you know, way out there, I would also like to give back to the community and I would like to come back and teach, be a faculty of a medical school. Um, and I think that all comes with having someone you can talk to, someone who's been through all that. Uh, so, yeah. Allison, thank you. That, again, very powerful. And I think um, to reiterate, you know, is 
finding these spaces, right, these sacred spaces where we can be vulnerable and safe and, and be uh, our, where our feelings can be validated is so, so, so important. And, you know, especially for first gen students, especially for um, fast paced, you know, uh, lifestyles and uh, education uh, pathways, things like that. And, um, you know, if we hold on to uh, those uncertainties for too long or those those feelings of discomfort for too long, you know, they can manifest in different ways, you know, whether it be being overworked or burnout um, or um, stressed, um, anxiety, you know, all these kinds of things. So it's I'm glad that you found that. Uh, and um, it sounds like many of you have it as well. So that's awesome. It's awesome. I've, I'm, I'm happy I found those support systems. Um, I do want to uh, move on to the next exciting question. Um, I think uh, I think we may have done that. We should be on the how did you manage? There we go. Thank you for that. So this next question um, is is a hot topic uh, for for medical students. Um, but how did you manage or balance your studies, home life, work life, involvement in extracurricular activities, um, Netflix, you know, <laughs> music? How did you keep up uh, with all of that as well as you know your college, the college life? Are we going to talk about college or like med school? You're welcome to discuss whatever you'd like. Uh, I think there's there could be many uh, overlap, many experiences that really overlap with, with both, but whichever stands out the most to you, you're welcome to unpack that if you'd like. Okay, um, I can start. So um, I'm from Houston. So back when I was home, I think there was a bit more quote unquote distractions. Um, I have childhood friends who grew up there. Um, I went to college in Houston. So I think a lot of the time, um, I believe in work hard, play hard. So I always tell myself that I'm gonna put myself six hours of studying and we're gonna get it done and we're gonna do whatever we want afterwards. And that's how I worked like throughout like the end of college and into med school. Um, Cause I realized that um, going into med medical school, it's like fun and all. But at the same time, you can't treat other people when you yourself is not in a stable position, as in mentally, physically, emotionally, um, and all that. Um, and so I realized I, I would like to work out. I would like to cook myself a good meal. I would like to enjoy some time, you know, smiling instead of looking at the computer all day, right? Like at this point, I might as well like wear glasses for my entire life. Um, so I think finding that balance of like, okay, you need to be strict with yourself. Um, regarding that. So I know a lot of like students in my class in Nayeli's and I's class, um, their parents. So like, how do they do this? You know, on top of being a medical student, how are they a parent outside of school? And a lot of my friends told me like, I only study eight to five, it's like a job. And the rest of the day, I'm at home with my kids. I wake up early to take care of my toddler and that's how it works. Um, so I think that's something to take, in, take into consideration. Um, so my life, we usually at least now it's like go to a clinic after clinic um, try to go exercising like three day, three times a week cook myself two or three times a week like meal prep and then outside of that i'm just having fun hanging with people painting i'm going swimming um having a movie night talking to my roommate things like that so it's very doable i think it just takes some adjustment adjustment and some time to get used to it um everyone has this Maybe not everyone, but I think most people I know, they have this imposter syndrome. You just feel like you're not good enough or you're not like the others, and you are. Um, it just takes time for you to know that. Um, no one no one brags about being bad, right? Everyone brags about being the best. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind, and uh, you can do it. Thank you, Allison. I think that's it's refreshing to hear that uh, coming, coming from uh, the, the panel tonight. I think... Um, I like that you establish like a structured reward system, right? For like, right, I'm gonna do this, um, then I can, you know, go and do something, do something fun, right? Or um, I think that you know that works for um, many, many, many people. And I think you know others kind of go about it, you know, in their own unique way. I know for me in particular, like I, I'm very satisfied if I have, you know, my daily goals met. 
you know, I'm like, all right, I can sleep tonight, you know. <laughs> um, but I also uh, like that you acknowledge like, hey, you know what, like, if I want to be my best, right, if I want to battle this imposter syndrome, we really need to have a conversation with ourselves and say, how are we really taking care of ourselves? How are we engaging in our own self care? You know, what are we doing to recoup? And what are we doing to recharge? Um, I had a conversation earlier. And you know, we talked about that as so we oftentimes we're we're moving too fast to really stop and smell the roses, right? To really stop and say, hey, I'm gonna take a break, you know, and you know, I, I'm, I want to give you my best self. So let me recharge a little bit. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. I can go about this all night, yeah, but I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to um, keep going. Uh, but thank you for sharing, Allison. Who else would like to share? I can go. Um, so as for college and med school, I'm a huge planner. Like I will plan out like my week and it's not hour by hour, but it's kind of close hour by hour. It's like I will have this done by this time. And I think one thing that all the people in the audience should kind of start figuring out before they get to college is when is the best time that you learn? Are you a morning person and you're like, oh, give me that 8 a.m.? Or do you like to sleep till noon and need to go to those 1 p.m. classes? Because that will help you a lot. College is different from high school. You're not always going to be there from 8 to 5. You make your own schedule for a big portion of it. And so knowing when you learn best will help you. Because if you learn it right the first time, you don't have to relearn it later on. So I'm definitely a morning person. I had the 8 a.m.s. I was that person until I was a senior doing the 8 a.m.s um, just to get it done. And then my afternoons were anything I wanted them to be. In med school, I've tried to treat it very similar. So UTMB has it where in your first year, all your classes are from 8 to 12. And then in your second year, all your classes are from 1 to 5. And the rest of the time is yours. And so using that, I utilize my time. So that way, no matter if I was a first year or a second year, I would be done by five in the afternoon, like after dinner, I could do what I wanted, watch Netflix, work out, recuperate, really anything. And so I think just having a plan really helps. And then um, I have the questions on my phone, so that way I can know. Oh, and then I also really lucked out because I was an RA in college and they paid for my meals. And then now at UTMB, we have medical fraternities and I'm actually in one and we have a chef, so I don't have to cook. So if you can have a setup like that, I recommend it, but I know it's not the norm. And so most of the people meal prep like on Saturday or Sunday, because that's just another thing you don't have to think about. Um, so I would say that is what I have to say about that. That sounds like a sweet deal. I'm, I'm, I'm a foodie, so anything like free food, okay, sign yeah. me up. You know, that, sounds, that sounds amazing. Um, <clears throat> So I do, I do like that you mentioned, uh, you know, you kind of hinted at, you know, everyone finds their own way, right? They find their groove on their own time. Um, sometimes it may take a little longer or sometimes you, even, you know, it could be disrupt, disrupted. So um, it's about finding that equilibrium, finding that momentum, moving forward um, and owning it. You know, like, hey, this, this was what works for me. It may not work for other people or maybe even small aspects of could work. Um, so. It, it's not, there's no right or wrong way, but I'm happy you found yours. And I think that that's awesome. Um, for the sake of time, um, I do want to acknowledge one thing and then quickly move on to the, the last question. Um, I forgot to say this earlier, but I wanted to acknowledge and recognize that our student panelists tonight are all jumpers. Um, many of y'all may have already caught that in, you know, in the dialogue, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that we are very proud of them and that, um, that they're happy. We're, I'm happy that they're here uh, to share their experiences with everyone. Okay, now let's move on to the last question. Um, drum roll, no, no, no I'm kidding. Um, so what advice do you have uh, for other first-gen students or parents of first-gen uh, students wishing to pursue medical school education? This is a, the golden question tonight. I would say to reach out to students, so like actual students, because I remember and like, you know, me, Kendall, Allison, or if you're a parent, Miss Veronica, because I remember being a pre-med and going on like Reddit and reading these crazy things or going on like, what is it, like WebMD and just reading like things that I'm like, wow, these people are like super high scorers or like have this perfect application. And it, I just didn't feel like that was me. And so I was just like, I'm never going to get in or I'm never going to be a jumper. You know, I would look at the website and be like, you have to be perfect. Um, and so then I reached out to like randomly, you know, I saw on the website jumpers and I found their email and I emailed them and 
um, then connected through social media. And like they helped me kind of structure my essays, helped me structure my application, not just for JAMP, but for medical school. Um, and so I think it's super important to just find an individual that you resonate with. Allison kind of talked about mentors that you kind of feel comfortable asking those questions and being guided by them. Um, and I feel like it's just really important to find someone, even if you don't know them, don't be afraid to send them a DM, send them an email and just kind of ask, um, because I think that really helped me. And, and it kind of threw away the whole Reddit thread and uh, WebMD and, and kind of helped me calm down. So I would really, really um, advise that for first gen students or not first gens, but that are pursuing a medical education. I think a lot of people try to put this mask of, oh, I have perfect scores, perfect everything. And sometimes I feel like it's not really like that, but that really helped me. And I feel like it would help other students as well. All right, thank you. I think that piece of advice is uh, very powerful, you know, and it is still, um, it highlights a, a very important element or aspect of students, particularly first gens who are on this journey, right, of, of saying, hey, no, uh, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask for help, and you know, and say you need something, right? And um, it also ties to this complex web of what imposter syndrome can look like and what it can do to us. Like, are we asking the right questions, right? What if we ask a dumb question? I was like, well, there's no such thing, right? It's genuine curiosity, and it's just, you know, being vulnerable and, and finding the, you know, the uh, the spaces and people that can offer you what you need. Right, so I think that's that's important. Thank you for sharing, Nayeli. Who would I was like going to make um, very quick. So also resonating with Nayeli, just um, find a good mentor, um, reach out to students. That's very helpful. And I think the biggest thing also is just to remind your parents that it'll be worth it in the end. And just the way is just a little bit long, but um, we'll get there one day. And I think my parents waited a while and they're just like, are you sure you don't want to like just go teach or do something else? And so I think um, reassuring your parents is like a big thing. And so thanks to parents like Miss Veronica, you know, we're here today and we can push through all this. Uh, I can go. Thank you for sharing, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Kendall. OK, so the road that you take, it's not going to be easy, especially as first gens. We're beginning before the starting line or we're beginning from behind the starting line. And so I just wanna say, never let the word no stop you. You're gonna hear people tell you, no, you can't do it. You're not gonna make it. Why do you think you deserve to go to medical school? All the other things. And you cannot let the word no stop you. You've gotta let it fuel you. And if medicine's what you're meant to do, it will work out. I mentor a lot of students, so I'm happy to mentor anybody like I think I need my email or something like that. Um, but one of the girls that I mentored, she had to take a gap year, retook the MCAT, and she's starting as an MS1 this fall. And she never let the word no stop her. And she just kept going. And so I think that's the best advice I can give you guys. There's a will, there's a way. <laughs> Thank you, Kendall. Yeah, that's powerful. Find, find those mentorship, mentorships, y'all. It's uh, so, so important. Um, thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Yeah. And just kind of on that same note, um, you don't want to compare your kid's path to any other path. Every student, you could have two of the same kids from the same parents and they'll be completely different. So whether or not your kid goes through, you know, right after they graduate from college or if they need a gap year or two to fill in some of the things that they're missing, you just can't compare it. Just as a parent, just support your student, their journey, and what it takes to get there, to their dreams. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, y'all. Um, do any of y'all have any last remarks about this final uh, discussion topic? No? OK. All right. Um, so I, from here, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to the Q&A. Um, I do want to say our seminar committee um, really appreciates our panelists uh, for sharing their words of wisdom um, and experiences with all of our attendees and the time um, each of y'all took to participate in, in this uh, really amazing discussion tonight. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask um, Enrique um, to maybe pull up a few questions from our audience um, that were asked during the panel session um, that, you know, either of us can can you know quickly address or um, unpack a little bit um, 
you know, Dr. Uh, Robles, you're, fr you're free to join this Q&A as well, um, if, if you'd like. All right, the first question, can they talk about the JAMP program and what should our application and personal essays reflect? I think the best route would be to be maybe begin with Dr. Robles to kind of talk about the, uh, the essays itself and the application briefly, and then uh, have maybe one of one or two of our JAM, uh, JAMPers, JAM students kind of talk about what that process looked like for them, sure. if they remember. So <laughs> I will address this very briefly. Uh, but there are a couple of essays that are required uh, for the JAMP application. Um, they cover basic motivation in medicine, meaningful experiences, uh, things like that. More information can be found on our application handbook, uh, but I'll actually turn it over to our JAMPers themselves to talk a little bit about what they wrote. Yeah, um, I can talk about what I wrote since I'm writing a new personal statement currently for my residency applications. I talked about what drew me into medicine, how I did that through the community service or through the work that I was doing. Um, I talk about it so much now, it's weird. But I was attached to a wound back for nine months. I had to carry it around with me through college. And it really showed me a different side of medicine that a lot of people don't get to see. Because I was a patient, a long-term patient. And a lot of people who go into medicine, they've seen it in their family members, or they just feel the need to go into it. And I got to see it from both sides, which now in my fourth year, and especially in my third year, I've worked with people who've had the same machine that attached to them. And it's just a different level of care that you can give the patient. So I talked about that. And no, not everybody's going to have the same story. You shouldn't have the same story as anybody else. Um, but I think doing a personal story that relates to your journey towards medicine is the best way to do it. Um, and now that Dr. Morales, I can see him again, he actually interviewed me when I did my JAMP interviews. And it was amazing. So I just I agree with Kendo. I think it has to be, in terms of your essays, just find the reason why you're going into medicine and expand on that. I don't think the admissions committee or committee for anyone wants to see like a perfect, oh, I've, you know, wanted to be a doctor since I was three or, or if that's your story, you know, share that. But I think for me specifically, um, it was, you know, having like living through a like not having healthcare insurance and like, you know, Dr. Morales, my parents were also undocumented for the majority of my life, seeing how physicians treated them in a rural East Texas town, seeing how they were maybe, you know, laughed at, mocked at by the nurses, by the staff, seeing that as a young girl, um, and then being like, what do I want to change? You know, I obviously can't change everything, but I can do my part. Um, and so I wrote about that and I wrote about my grandma and my grandparents and, and the struggles that they faced because like Dr. Morales said, they, they didn't know they weren't educated. And so I think that um, we as physicians, future physicians have that job to, to look into the culture of our patients and see, okay, how can we best help them and help make their lives a little bit easier in terms of their health? I'm gonna say the same thing as Nayeli and Kendall. Um, do what's most comfortable. If it's your story, it's going to be the easiest to tell. And I think you just got to go with that. Um, instead of, you know, pulling a lot of things together, just do one story that you're most comfortable with, you witness, you went through it. And I think that's, that's all it takes. Oh, can I add one more thing? You will get asked about anything in your application. So be ready to talk about it. I volunteered at a Santa run in Dallas, and they asked me about that on my interview. And I was like, yeah, I helped volunteer for it. It was it was the most random thing on my application to me, but they chose it and talked to me about it. So be ready to talk about whatever you put on there. I, obviously, I'm not a, a JAMP student, but I have a JAMP heart. And I think if the JAMP program was there, I would have probably been part of the JAMP program. But as an admissions person, I would tell you there's two broad th team themes for any personal essays. What's your motivation and how dedicated can you be to accomplishing the goal of graduating? If you can check those two boxes, you're doing yourself some good and make it a personal story. Um, and the other part of it is, um, uh, Kendall's correct, you know, anything on your application is fair game to be asked. So make sure you know your application backwards and forwards. 
Thank you for sharing. I, I have a little bit to add to um, I, you know, we did some some site visits, you know, this summer, and we, we talked a lot about essays. I would like to also maybe recommend, um, you know, if you're at a, a college university, you know, and you need assistance, you know, um, external assistance, you know, go visit the writing center, right? Like, let them let them review your essays alongside you, right? And, you know, do your best to make them make them as strong as they, as they can be. Um, I know a lot of us um, may look at, you know, rely on spell check or other programs like Grammarly or whatever you use. Um, but I always told my students, you know, when I was, when I was um, during our essay workshops, you're smarter than a computer. <laughs> so, you know, go and, you know, work with another human being on these, you know, and brainstorm how we, we can strengthen these essays together. Um, yeah, but have, have multiple people read your essays. You know, it's okay. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to add, add that. Do uh, Enrique, do we have any other questions from the our audience? All right, we have one from Alejandro. Are the students able to choose what participating medical school in JAMP they will attend? Good question. Dr. Robles, would you like to? <laughs> sure. Uh, so with the JAMP uh, anyways, uh, eligible medical or eligible students will be able to interview at the participating medical schools. Uh, and we'll certainly get a chance to rank uh, them as they interview at them. Uh, so certainly student choice does go into a lot of how a student is actually matched into medical school. It's a great question. I would say this too, from the admissions perspective, the JAMP students are the only students are, uh, that will interview at every single, well, not every single, but just every single participating medical school in the JAMP program. Um, very rarely do we have a regular applicant interview as many places as the champ students do. For even more context with that, there's 13 participating yes. medical schools in JAMP. Yes. Uh, so that is <laughs> quite a few. Uh, it is quite a least. few. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. And we'll move on to the next question. Uh, researchers for Change, they ask Can we still apply for JAMP if we are not an incoming freshman? Hmm. Uh, sure, I can uh, tackle that one, Josh. Uh, so we do look for students who are uh, within their first year of college after graduation from high school. Um, so when we say freshmen, that's a little bit of a um, little bit of a misnomer because some students may actually have college credit uh, and they come in as sophomores or juniors or something. So really, uh, just consider when you graduated from high school. If you're within that year, then yeah, absolutely, uh, do the application. And uh, remember, if, if uh, we have additional follow-up questions, you're welcome to email um, email us, which I'll share on, on the next slide, um, or give us a phone call. Uh, that's a, That was a good question. Thank you. All right. Next question is, I, I'm raising, uh, I am raising high school, a high school senior. What should we be looking to have taken care of soon? Okay, so uh, what can we do during high school? Um, our senior year to prepare for applying to JAMP. I hope I, I read that correctly. Uh, I can answer this from the JAMP perspective, but I think um, our, our JAMP students and maybe even Dr. Morales, uh, perhaps even Veronica might have a few thoughts about here. Um, but I will say this uh, for JAMP anyways, having a good solid foundation in your sciences uh, will certainly pay dividends to you uh, as you continue on uh, into your undergraduate career. I would also recommend uh, getting in contact with the health professions advising office sooner rather than later uh, at your undergraduate institution if you understand that you might even be thinking about becoming a physician in the future or maybe if you're just considering that pathway uh, getting in contact with an advisor will certainly pay you dividends um, but i'll defer to the rest of uh, the group here um, i think nothing specific but in general have an organized way of tracking what you did maybe transitioning into um, college. So it's like senior year of high school and then like first year of college, because a lot of a lot of the times when you're applying to different scholarships and application, even for JAMP, they will ask you, what have you done in the past? And it's very hard to pull out your brain and be like, I did this a year and a half ago. And it'll be like, how many hours? How many times a week? Um, and what did you do actually? And is there a, point, uh, a person of contact, uh, point of contact, I mean. So I think, um, 
having that, like, I think I started having an Excel my freshman year of college, just including everything I did, um, leading up like volunteering hour, hospital hours, community service. Um, anytime I'm like, I guess, mentoring other students where I work, things like that. So uh, definitely keep track of those things. And I still do that for medical school because it's also important for residency application. And maybe Kendall can attest to that. <laughs> Yes, it is definitely important. I, starting medical school, I kept a running CV of everything I did. I'd write a little paragraph about it and it has made ERAS, that's the residency application, so much easier to fill out. I just copy and paste. Um, and I, Dr. Robles, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but cert, I think it's in tech, I know you have to be out of school in Texas, but not every school in Texas is affiliated with the JAMP program. And so you might want to look up and see the schools that you're attending if they're affiliated with it. That typically goes for more private schools. Um, so I went ACU. It's a private Christian college, um, and they're part of the JAM program. Um, so yeah, yes. there are uh, 68 public and private institutions uh, that are affiliated with JAM. Uh, they'll typically be your four-year undergraduate institutions uh, themselves. Uh, but as Kendall mentioned, I mean, honestly, visit TexasJAM.org. We have a list of all the participating schools as well as faculty folks uh, directly at those institutions as well who can help you out if you were thinking about JAMP. I would say something that's like not academically. I think Allison and Kendall covered it pretty well, but just enjoy like as a high school senior, like enjoy being at home, enjoy your family because I feel like looking back, I didn't take as much advantage of it. I was like, I'm ready to get out. I'm ready to go to college. I'm ready to go do this and that. Um, and now it's kind of like, you know, you're growing older. If you're pursuing a medical degree, you're going to be home, probably away from home for a while. Your parents are growing older. Anything can happen between now and the time you get your degree. Family members can pass away, you know, stuff like that. Um, so just truly value up your time at home that last year. Um, and make sure you feel you 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 uh, take it all in before moving out and, and getting into all these um, applications and, and all those open things. I think everyone here basically covered all the thoughts I had. I, I would say just as a you know disclaimer for anyone pursuing or wanting to pursue this this career track, I always say as a high schooler, challenge yourself. You know, in regards to the academic classes you're taking, oftentimes there's this point the students want to be ranked in the whatever top 10 and there's you know courses they take to be able to achieve that versus taking the courses that are really going to help them in college I always say take courses that are rigorous you know and the sciences are going to help you in in undergrad and vice versa or same thing i should say in, in undergrad that would help you in medical school i always say that what you learn in one year in high school is a semester in college what you learn in one semester in college is about one to two weeks in medical school so you want to make sure that you, um, you know, have that sound that that foundation of the sciences underneath your belt. All right. So, um, so get into contact with an advisor. Stay organized with my transition into college and focus on my sciences and family time. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that sounds about right. Uh, <laughs> good, good summary there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can, can you share your notes with us, with the, with the audience, right? <laughs> All right, uh, Luis, uh, does being a biological science major improve our chances to get into JAMP or medical school, or can we be any major? I'll jump on this one first, and I'll let everyone else kind of, I, so I was a chemical engineering major, so the answer to that question is no, but uh, there's a word that we use frequently, holistic, in regards to how we look at applications. And so we've had everything. I've seen everything from uh, art history to music to theater arts, uh, all the way up to the biological sciences. Now, obviously, the top three that we see every year and year out is biology, biochemistry, and neuroscience. But you don't have to be those to be able to apply to the JAMP or uh, into medical school. Dr. Morales, would you say there are certain benefits for um, maybe being certain majors? Well, I would say this, and, and you know, if you're that non-science major, you know, from the admissions perspective, we will rigorously look at your transcript to make sure that you are capable of handling the sciences, right? So, um, it, you know, try to go above and beyond. The, there's your, every school has basically the same prerequisites in the state of Texas. 
uh, I think we've done a great job um, uh, of, of making sure those goals are standardized. Um, but try to you know challenge yourself. If you have some elective time in your last couple of years of your undergrad career, if you're not now in science major, take an upward vision biology course. Do something that's going to prepare you for medical school. Um, but I would say that the only advantage would be that you have the um, more of an enhanced background in the sciences that you might be able to see coming into medical school would be the only advantage you would have. But you don't have to be that. I've seen students who are, like I said, non-science majors who are very successful in med school, but um, but then, you know, obviously they have, you know, like all these three young people here, they have you know, really great study habits and, uh, and are very organized when it comes to their approach to, uh, to study. All right. All right. So um, does being an early high school graduate negatively affect me? Very good question. I would say no. Um, you know, I, I think I, I think there's a couple of things. I think Nayeli said it the best when it comes to enjoying your youth and making sure that you have that time with your family. Um, I think Dr. Robles and I might remember this TV show called Doogie Hauser. Um, everyone wants to be Doogie Hauser, but I see you don't have to be Doogie Hauser to be a doctor, you know. Um, so, um, so you don't rush yourself to to or put that pressure on you to, to become a physician you know there's obviously steps you want to take and um but don't don't put that pressure to be able to do that so it won't negatively hurt you i don't know how much it would help you quite honestly does anyone else want to add to that Okay, and we could do we could probably do one one or two more. Ah, good question. Can the panelists <laughs> please share their emails? I believe we um, will have already sent or will send them out. Is that correct? I think Enrique put some in already. Yeah. Okay. We will also share um, the emails, our email on the next on the next slide. Um, maybe after one last uh, audience question. But yes, to answer that, yes, they will be shared. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. All right, let's do one more, and then we'll do a little closing. When will we find out if we get accepted into JAMP? All right. <laughs> I can uh, tackle this one, actually. Uh, so the application period uh, typically runs between May through roughly September, October. Um, from there, uh, if you are invited for an interview, because there is an interview as part of this process, you generally find that out by December or so. Interviews typically happen in January, uh, and then, of course, we give you the great news in February. Uh, so that's kind of the general time frame here. Of course, we're always happy to help. Uh, so give us a holler uh, if you have any questions. And speaking of giving us a holler, then I think that's uh, we, the next slide has our contact information. So, um, but, but before we go to that, I would like to um, first extend my uh, deepest gratitude to Dr. Morales and our seminar panelists for sharing such beautiful experiences um, and words of wisdom and advice uh, with everyone in our audience. I learned so much from y'all, and I hope to continue learning from from JAM students, from uh, medical school students, from first chance students. You know, um, but so thank you. Um, and I'd also like to thank each of our uh, seminar attendees um, on behalf of our event planning team for sharing your evening with us and making our inaugural first generation medical student seminar uh, such a success tonight. Um, so should you have any kind of lingering questions or comments or concerns, you know, always feel free to reach out to our team at our contact information, at our, at our contact information on the next slide. Um, 
so it was you know really great to see everyone tonight and um, our seminar team wishes y'all a safe and restful evening and re remainder of your week um, so we are now free to to end the broadcast so thank y'all for coming out thank you